Heavenly Father, God, we come to you now and we ask humbly that you will help us and cause us to see wonderful things from your law, from your word. Please build us up with this passage in Genesis. Please give me divine help, Lord, to speak clearly. And please give us all ears to hear that our strength, our, our faith will be strengthened this morning. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, starting with our exposition of the text, um, Genesis 22, 1 to 14. If you will follow along as we're reading God's word together. Uh, verse 1 says, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Um, so our passage this morning begins, and it, it, it references some things, um, after these things. Uh, I'm going to walk us through some context here quickly, because I think it's helpful um, for us to understand um, what's going on. It helps us to grasp the significance of this passage this morning. Um, Genesis 22 is the climax of the Abraham and Sarah promised child arc, if you will. In Genesis 17, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a multitude of nations. God promised him that he would be prosperous with many children. But more importantly, Genesis 17, 7, the Lord says to Abraham, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring, and I will be their God. So God's promise to Abraham is that his entire line will be blessed. How? God will be their God, and they will be his people. There is a problem, at least in the eyes of Abraham and Sarah. They were childless. They did not have children of their own. Abraham and Sarah heard the, the promise, and they continued to not have children of their own. Um, they had tried to take matters in their own hands um, by having Abraham have a child with Sarah's servant, Hagar. They had a child, Ishmael, but he is not the promised child of God. Um, Abraham even appeals to God, saying, let it be Ishmael, let Ishmael be before you. And God specifically rejects Ishmael as the promised child. And it's not until Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90 years old that God opens Sarah's womb and Isaac, the promised child, is born. They waited over two decades from when the promise was given to Abraham to when Isaac was born. 25 years passed by. That's older than some of us in this room. <laughs> Just consider how much life happens in 25 years. That's how long they waited from between the promise and when Isaac was born. And so we begin in verse 1, and we don't know exactly how much time has passed or how much time has elapsed. We don't know how old Isaac is. It just says, after these things. Um, but as we see, and we will see as we go along, Isaac is old enough to speak, and he's old enough to reason to some degree. And the word that's used to refer to him as a boy um, in Hebrew can range in meaning from infant to a grown man. So <laughs> there's a, in terms of how old Isaac is, it's like in between there. <laughs> uh, but given that he can reason and he can speak, um, most commentators uh, think that he's at least a preteen, so at least 12 years old. Um, in, in Genesis, this word refers to Joseph when he's 17. And it's used to refer to Abraham's servants when they're able to carry out independent tasks. So we, we assume that Isaac is around that age. So after some time has passed, God is about to test Abraham. And it will be the hardest test of his life. But before we get into the details of the test, don't miss the interaction that we, hear, that we see right here in, in verse 1. The very first interaction between God and Abraham is God calling Abraham and Abraham saying, here I am. We don't know the, the contents of the test yet, but we already see a posture of obedience to God from Abraham. Verse 2, 
He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And so this is the test. Take your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him there as a burnt offering. Thus says the Lord. Our understanding of a burnt offering gets flushed out much later in Leviticus, um, but a burnt offering is a common offering. It's a common type of sacrifice um, to worship God with. Um, it's, in the Old Testament, that's, that's a primary function. It's, it's, a, it's for worship, and it consists of taking an unblemished animal, cutting up the animal, dividing the animal into, different, into, into its parts, and then burning up the whole of the animal on an altar in worship of God. The animal is meant to be reflective of the, the worshiper offering the animal um, it, in, in the sense that the, the whole animal is offered, killed, and consumed uh, as an offering. The whole of the person um, is, it comes to worship the Lord, so it's meant to reflect the, the whole of the person. And, and it's offered to God in atonement and, and worship. By implication, the burnt offering costs the animal its life. The animal was slaughtered, uh, the animal was divided, the animal was burned up with fire before the Lord. So make no mistake, Abraham, when he hears the, these words, he knows the implications of this command. He did not receive this command metaphorically, to metaphorically offer up Isaac as a burnt offering. He would not have received this command in any other way except that God is asking, commanding him to sacrifice the life of his only beloved son. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. If Abraham had questions to God, as I think I would, <laughs> we get no indication of them in the text. That's going to be consistent as we go through this. We, we will, so, I so badly would love, like I, I'm a relational person, I, I would love to get a window into like how, how did Abraham feel? We don't get that, largely. Um, but we do see in verse 3, after the command is given, is Abraham going. He rose early in the morning, made preparations, and went on his way. Given the test and the nature of the test, verse 3 is just tremendous. That it just says that he rose and early in the morning and went. Um, why did Abraham take two men with him? Uh, presumably, well, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not a short journey, <laughs> um, but it's also watched a donkey while Abraham and Isaac go up to do the sacrifice. And again, Abraham at this, at this point is over a hundred years old, so maybe some help was given as they made the journey. Um, but here we'll see a complicated, perplexing dialogue between Abraham and these two men. Let's look at verse 4 and 5. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. Verse 5 is difficult to make sense of. Um, what, he said, what Abraham says to these young men, especially in light of the command from God and Abraham's understanding of the command, uh, it's, it's difficult to understand why did he say, hey, Isaac and I will go, we'll, we'll make the sacrifice, and then, and then we will come back to you. I think that there's three ways you can interpret this. Um, one, Abraham is telling a lie <laughs> to the, the young men. Uh, maybe he couldn't bear to tell them the truth. Um, Abraham has been dishonest uh, in, in the past <laughs> with his wife, uh, about his wife um, to other people. So maybe he was telling a lie. Um, two, Abraham, not knowing exactly how, simply trusts that Isaac will still return even after sacrificing him as a burnt offering. Uh, somehow. <laughs> um, this seems to be supported by Scripture. Um, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews eleven nineteen writes that Abraham 
considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, him being Isaac, his son. Or three, um, you could interpret this response as, you know, to some mixture of both, that, that Abraham spoke maybe out of confusion, <laughs> and he just had to say something to, to the men. Um, and maybe we ought not to be too, too harsh on a father who doesn't know quite what to say to people about the situation. This is what John Calvin writes, by the way, that, that Abraham spoke confusedly here to the young men. I think that the second interpretation is correct because Scripture affirms it, and, and that Abraham believed that a miracle will happen, um, even though he, he doesn't know the details. So Abraham's ready to go through the test. Um, let's take a look at verses 6 through 8. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on, his, on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. It's just Abraham and Isaac now. And he takes the wood, he puts the wood on Isaac to help carry, and they go to the place of sacrifice. Wood, fire, knife, <laughs> these are the necessary tools um, that anticipate the sacrifice to come. Isaac picks up on this, and he's, he sees the fire, the wood, the knife, and, and he reasons, and he's like, Dad, where's the, where's the animal? <laughs> Where is the animal? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So we see here, Isaac is not aware of the plan. He's not aware of the details. Abraham has seemingly not told him. Again, I'd love to know what's in the head of Abraham when his son asks him this question. We don't know. I think everyone as parents, um, if you imagine yourself in the shoes of Abraham, when your son asks you this question, the difficulty um, in having an answer, Isaac calls him my father, and Abraham calls him my son. This is affectionate language. And Abraham's answer to his son this time is also perplexing, because he says God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Again, there's a few different ways you can interpret this. I think you could read this at face value, that Abraham simply believes that God will provide an alternative and won't require the sacrifice, the slaughter of his son. It's an attractive option. I don't think it's quite right because you could come to the conclusion that, well, Abraham then was not actually ready and he was never really willing to, to sacrifice his son and he was going through the motions and, and just maybe at the last second God will provide and, and maybe Abraham then isn't willing to go through with it. Um, I don't think that's the right way to read this. Um, we get every indication in the preceding and following verses that Abraham is ready and willing to follow through with God's command. Um, two, could, Abraham could mean that Isaac is the lamb. <laughs> That, that God has provided and for himself as a burnt offering. Um, maybe seeing Isaac as from the Lord, given from the Lord, and so he's the sacrifice. Um, or three, Abraham again is answering confusedly, um, ambiguously. And again, lest we be too harsh on Abraham, I, I put myself in, in his shoes and, and I don't know what I would say um, in that moment. So both of them continue. Uh, together on the way, verses 9 and 10, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. The scene is set. Abraham ar arrives at the place that God had told him. He builds the altar knife in hand. Um, I think it's crucial to see a, a really important detail here, that Abraham builds the altar, lays the wood, and binds Isaac. Um, he does not slaughter Isaac first, <laughs> um, but he binds him. Um, consider that Abraham is over a hundred years old at this point, 
and Isaac is a young man, (laughs) um, the fact that Isaac is bound while alive, I think, gives a window to Isaac's willingness, to Isaac's obedience. That like like father and, and son, we see Isaac also display remarkable obedience. Because if I were if I were a young man and my father or my grandfather, who's over a hundred years old, um, wanted to bind me and sacrifice me, and I was an unwilling participant, I think I could do something about it. <laughs> Um, I, I imagine like a, a hundred plus year old man trying to, like Pastor Matt's o- oldest two sons, like at this point they're, you know, I, I imagine, you know, Isaac to be maybe around this age or older, like trying to bind Abraham or, or Josiah, like, like as a hundred plus year old man, like I don't think it would happen. Um, but we see no words from Isaac of protest. We have no indication that Isaac is told what's going on. We see him willingly bound. We see him submit to his father. And Abraham reaches out, knife in hand, ready to do the deed. So here's the climax of the passage. Um, Let's read verse 11 to 14. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. I, I love this. I, I, love, I love the word of God. I love how this is written. The angel of the Lord calls from heaven. Um, the angel of the Lord didn't, didn't descend and then go find Abraham. It just, it just says that the, the angel of the Lord called directly from heaven. <laughs> Abraham. Uh, there are different theories as to exactly who the angel of the Lord is. Um, I'm not going to spend much time talking about it. Um, is this the pre-incarnate Christ or not? Um, but I think the important detail to note is that throughout the Old Testament, we see that the angel of the Lord speaks with the same authority as the Lord himself. There is no distinction between the angel of the Lord speaking and the Lord speaking. Um, so God calls directly um, from heaven, <laughs> and he says, Abraham, Abraham, the, the double name call, <laughs> which anytime you see the double name call in scripture, it's, it's important. It's, it's urgent. Uh, it's like when you're trying to get the attention of someone, like, oh, the piano is falling, like, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, the piano is falling. Like, like there's, you're trying to get the attention of someone urgently. And there's a big question that arises from verse 12 of what the angel says. For now I know that you fear God. Uh, this could have been another sermon. Um, it kind of was, and I had to cut it down. <laughs> um, but this verse alone, it can be a, a big one to, come, to unpack. Like, what does it mean that for the Lord to, to now know? <laughs> Did he not know before? <laughs> um, let me just say that verse 12 does not contradict um, God's foreknowledge and, and his sovereignty. Um, we should interpret this knowing in verse 12 as, as a confirmation, as, a, as an experiential actualization of God's knowledge, of God knowing. Um, and so God in his foreknowledge knew that Abraham feared the Lord. He knew that he would be willing to sacrifice his beloved son. And Abraham being obedient actualizes and confirms this knowledge with his obedience. I'll talk a bit more about this in the, in the application. And at the word of the angel of the Lord, Abraham lifts his eyes and sees a ram, a male sheep. Um, there is no explicit command here from the angel to sacrifice the ram, but Abraham puts two and two together. Don't lay uh, a hand on the boy. Here's the, here's the ram, and it caught in the, by its horns in the thicket. And, <clears throat> and so he offers up the, the ram as a sacrifice, and he calls the name of the place the Lord will provide. 
Abraham's answer to Isaac proves now to be true and has new meaning. The Lord will himself provide for the burnt offering. And if you know how to read Hebrew, um, I don't, (laughs) but if you do, um, there is some beautiful wordplay here between the name the Lord will provide in verse 14 and the name Moriah in verse 2. Um, I, it's there. I, I can't read Hebrew, so I, I, I can't draw out all the, the intricacies and the wonder of it, but it is there and, and um, it is significant. And that's how our passage ends this morning. Um, I would love to, to have a window to Abraham's thoughts and Isaac's thoughts at, the, uh, at this point, because it's like, what is he thinking and feeling as he's untying his son and making this sacrifice? Um, but we, we don't know. So that concludes the exposition of our text. We'll move on now to application of our text. I have six points of application from the text this morning. Two of those points are exhortations that will be specifically addressed to fathers. Uh, application point number one, the gravity of Abraham's test to sacrifice his only beloved son testifies to the gravity of God the Father who did not withhold his only beloved son, but gave him up for us all. This is an incredibly difficult, serious, and grave test for Abraham. Why have Abraham wait so long for the promised child, only to instruct him, to then slaughter this child and offer him up as a sacrifice, as an offering. And then at the very last moment, intervene to stop it. Why? As I was reading this, I I just kept asking that. Um, One of the reasons, I think, is so that thousands of years later, here we sit, and maybe we would understand with a little more clarity and feel with more gravity just what happened at the cross of Jesus. The cost that was paid by God the Father in sacrificing his own son. Those of you with children, how would you feel to give up your son or daughter unto death? Rena is six months old. And as I was thinking about that this week, I, I, I have a difficult time um, wrestling with that thought. Sam and I were trying for children for one and a half years um, before we had Rena. Um, Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years. And that's just from when the, the promise was given to when Isaac was born. That's, that's not considering the years prior where they were wanting children. 100 years old before Abraham had his son. Imagine then giving him up. I have friends, Christian friends, who um, they've, they are or have wrestled with barrenness, um, waiting um, for a child. Some of them are still waiting. And it's difficult to consider having waited that long and then giving him up. Sacrificing them. Uh, those of you with older children, I, I feel like there's actually additional layers of difficulty that then get added on top. <laughs> like, I, I can't imagine it, as you go through life with your child, having nursed and, and gone through birthdays and all these milestones. And again, like, I, I feel like the older and the more time you've spent with your children, the, the, the extra layers of difficulty are just, it's that much more, isn't it? It's, and so verse 2 should cause us to tremble when, when God says, Take your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering. And I want us to feel the gravity of that as if it were our own child. And then to consider Jesus, Son of God, who was with God the Father not six months or six years, 60 years, Jesus is with the Father and has been with the Father for eternity. Perfect union. 
In the book of Matthew, God says of Jesus, this is my son, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. On Jesus, God will lay the iniquities of man. On him, he will lay the penalty for all sin. And he shall die that we who are dead in sin might live. Jesus, like Isaac, and Isaac is such a picture of Jesus, carrying the, the, the very wood himself that, that would be his death. <laughs> in Jesus' case, the wood that he would then be crucified on. And instead of a voice at the very end saying, Abraham, don't lay a hand on your son. Instead, we hear the voice of Jesus say, it is finished. So this test of Abraham to sacrifice Isaac points us to the father who at great cost gave up his son as a sacrifice. Romans 5, 6 to 8, For while we, were, while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the example of Abraham and Isaac, I think, helps us feel the cost a little bit more, um, hopefully infinitely more, <laughs> when, as we consider Christ. And that as we consider this cost, that our worship of God, of Jesus, would be deeper. That would be that much more. Application point number two. Um, God tests so that what is in your heart is known. He tests so that what is in your heart is known. In verse 12, the angel of the Lord says, Now I know that you fear the Lord, seeing you have not withheld your, your own son, your only son, from me. <clears throat> if God has perfect knowledge and foreknowledge, and he does, um, why does he need Abraham to go through with this? Why test Abraham if he already knows perfectly? Why test Job? You know, like in Sunday school, like why test him when God knows he, and he has perfect knowledge? <clears throat> There's a, a lot of ways to answer this question. Some of it is philosophical. Um, I, th I think uh, the bulk of it is a conversation to be had over coffee or, or dinner um, in terms of like why does reality exist at all? Like why does, why does creation exist? Because if God has perfect foreknowledge and knows everything perfectly, why is there creation? Um, but the direction I'd like to take this morning in answering that question of why God tested Abraham is this. God's testing brings what is in your heart out into the light so that it can be known, so that it can be confirmed, so that it can be experientially actualized, um, especially for us who are, we are not God. So I don't know what's in my heart most of the time. And so God's testing brings that out so that it can be known. God's testing, trials, have a way of squeezing us. Isn't that right? It squeezes us, and we get to see what comes out. There are two outcomes I can think of um, that come from this kind of squeezing, this kind of, this kind of testing. Um, one of them is kind of more pessimistic. One of them is more optimistic. Um, I'll start with the pessimistic one first. Um, God's testing makes known the sin that is in my heart. If Abraham withheld Isaac and disobeyed God, it would have been sin. Uh, it, would, it would mean that Abraham loved Isaac more than he loved God. And if he failed the test, this is what it would have been brought to light. That maybe he was faithful in some parts of his life, but here... He's, uh, he's not faithful to love the Lord more than his son. And I think it's, maybe it's me and my personality, but these tests where I fail and, I, and what's revealed is, is sin in my heart, these are the tests that I more readily, easily remember. <laughs> um, so often God's testing reveals sin in my heart. It reveals 
areas of unfaithfulness, areas that need to be repented of um, and sanctified. And so, brothers and sisters, if you are like me um, and you are prone to feeling like, I have failed God's testing, or I feel like God tests me often and I frequently fail and am unfaithful, Here's a word for you. It is good of God to reveal sin in your heart, as painful as it may be. It is good, <clears throat> it is gracious for God to reveal that sin so that you can bring it to Him, so that you can repent and be restored. God, our Father, is more patient with His children than we can comprehend. And his patience is salvation. So if you feel this way, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Because in the moment, all discipline seems painful. And yes, when God brings sin in your heart to light, it is discipline. In the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Hebrews 12.10. Um, Sam and I recently went through a test, and, and I'd like to share this just to make it personal. Um, we went through a test recently, and that test, uh, and what was revealed in my heart <laughs> through that test, that test was the first two months of being an, uh, a parent, um, of being new parents and having a first child. Those first two months certainly revealed <laughs> what was in my heart. Um, like when I'm sleep deprived, when we're trying to adjust to new responsibilities, when, we're tr when I'm trying to also still love my wife um, as, as Christ loved the church, um, when I'm trying to figure out like the, the nap and the feeding schedules and the, still keeping up with chores and everything, um, that testing revealed in my heart that I was more sinful um, and weak than, and selfish than I ever could have thought. <laughs> Um, like I, I realize that by default, I will not be a loving, good, God-fearing father, um, but I will be a selfish one. That's, that's what was revealed. Um, I remember two in the morning, there was a climax of that where I, I was in the nursery and I was so angry at my newborn daughter. <laughs> Even saying it is, is just ridiculous, right? Like my newborn daughter being angry at her. Um, it was ugly. God made known to me what was in my heart. And praise the Lord, after confessing that sin to him and to, to Sam, there was a steadfast love of the Lord that I could feel. That yes, the Lord wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but he heals. The optimistic outcome you can think of, of when God tests you and, and, and what happens when, and when he is trying to make known what's in your heart is that God's testing strengthens faith, <laughs> that, that our faith becomes more firm and, and durable. Like, like Abraham, this, like I imagine if you were Abraham and you went through this test and you past, um, his faith would be made that much more firm, that, that he would know, like, I, I will obey. I will not withhold even what's most precious to me, my only son. I will not withhold that should the Lord ask me to give him up. Deuteronomy 8.2, Moses writes, You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Because maybe the Israelites thought that they would keep God's commandments until testing comes. And we know in the Old Testament what happens. Um, and so something else that was revealed in those first two months of being a, a new parent is that, um, yes, I was ugly in my sin, and that came out. But what also came out was that I really do have a love for the Lord that 
cannot compare to anything in my life. That, like, the days where I, I could not spend the uninterrupted time praying and reading his word, um, I, I desired God. I, I missed that time with the Lord. And, and then I, I would look at Sam in those first two months and, and just have such a newfound love for Sam, um, just seeing her and, and being so glad that she's my partner in life and seeing, seeing Rena where every day she's doing something new and it's something to marvel and, and to cherish. And, and, I, and I loved these, these two people so much in my life. And still, God showed me that God is better. God is more lovely. And I wouldn't have known that and so God tested that. And so God revealed um, that as well. He reveals sin um, that may be in your heart, and he reveals that which will strengthen your faith. Application point number three. Jesus confronts us with the same question that God asks of Abraham. And the question is this. What are you willing to sacrifice for the Lord? Or... If you're pessimistic, what are you unwilling to sacrifice for the Lord? <laughs> Deuteronomy 13, 3, For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Um, a few months ago we, in Mark, we went through the, the rich young ruler and the passage of the rich young ruler. And, and he comes to Jesus and he asks, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus eventually tells him, one thing you lack. Go and sell your possessions and give it to the poor. And he is unwilling to do that. He is unwilling to sacrifice that to the Lord. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul is something that Jesus affirms. Um, he affirms that this is the greatest commandment. And what we are willing or unwilling to sacrifice for the Lord Maybe it's our children, maybe it's a relationship, a spouse, a job. That testifies to how sure this love of the Lord is in our life. And so I want us to, to be encouraged. I want to encourage you this morning, church family, to not love anyone or anything more than you love the Lord. Even good things, especially good things. Jesus says, um, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Abraham this morning is like a live example of these words. That's comparative language. Jesus is not saying you literally need to hate your family, but it's by comparison, like if you were to compare your love for Jesus, it might look like you hate your family <laughs> and be willing to be thought of that this way. Some people may misunderstand you when you love the Lord this way. So what are you willing to sacrifice for the Lord? And what are you unwilling to sacrifice for the Lord? Um, the matter, uh, the answer to this is a matter of eternity. Um, it was for the rich young ruler, it was for Abraham, and this morning it, it is for us. Application point four. Obedience is a befitting expression of faith. In um, um, Abraham and, and Isaac, um, we see how faith manifests, what, what faith looks like. Um, the, the narrator does not speak to what they were thinking and feeling largely. It's, they are, the, it's, it's silent in terms of, you know, hey, like, how do they feel about this? I think to draw attention to one thing in this passage and to put it, make it abundantly clear, and it is obedience. Abraham's obedience to the Lord. There are examples of vain and empty obedience in Scripture. God hates this kind of obedience in terms of a outward obedience that does not match the, the inward heart that also de desires to obey and worship the Lord. But brothers and sisters, obedience is a beautiful thing. 
And I'd like us to be challenged by the example of Abraham and how his faith manifests. Because oftentimes when we think about trusting God and having faith in God, it, we think inward, we think internal. We think, oh, it means to, to have peace. It means to, to be calm. It, it means to no longer fret or to be anxious. It means to rest in the Lord and let Him work for you. This is all true, beautifully true. But obedience is also a befitting and glorious expression of faith. Imagine if God called Abraham, gave him the test, and Abraham prayed to him and said, God, I, I, and he wrestled through prayer, and then he trusted God, and he went to sleep peacefully, and he never woke up early in the morning to go. That is not faith. Faith in God expresses itself through obedience. To trust God is to also walk in the way that he has told you to go. And so let's not think of obedience as the outcome of faith and trust, as we often do. That like when I trust God and have faith in God, then I will obey. This morning, the story of Abraham shows us that obedience can be the means of trusting God. <laughs> obedience is a befitting expression of faith. Application points five and six. These last two points, I'll go through um, quickly. These are exhortations to fathers, uh, hopefully aspiring fathers, spiritual fathers. Um, these are not uh, exhortations that apply strictly to men and to fathers. Uh, they do also apply to, to moms. But again, it's Father's Day, and I, it seems fitting to address and take the time to, to exhort our, our fathers specifically. Um, application point five. Fathers, model a posture of obedience for your children. Uh, we live in a culture today where a, a posture of obedience is not attractive. Obedience is just not attractive, <laughs> by and large. Uh, it's, it's not a desirable trait thing, especially, I feel like, for men. Um, we often think of us as dads as we are the enforcers of obedience in our children. Um, that We set the rules, we set the standards, we enforce obedience. And my challenge to us this morning is this. How are you modeling a posture of obedience to your children. Isaac is a challenging example, isn't he? I mean, he, he's <laughs> like, I don't, this kind of trusting of his father, I, like, I, I pray, I'm like, let Rena have, be like Isaac, like this kind of trust, like even if she doesn't know what, what's going on in the situation and is confused, she will trust her father. Um, and I, I think, though, like, well, short of prayer and God giving this disposition, <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> How can the grace of God work through me as a father um, to train up my child in this way? Um, and one of the ways uh, is this ex exhortation, which is fathers model the, the, the posture of obedience to your children um, that you'd want them to have. A posture of obedience, first and foremost, to God. Um, let, bridge that for them. Let your children see that. That they see that dad gives instructions and dad, dad is, it, it requires me to obey, but that dad himself obeys God and he loves to obey God. Teach them. That obedience is not just something you require of them and doesn't apply to you. But show them that you're trying to instill in them the obedience that, that you have unto the Lord. And our last uh, point of application, our last exhortation to fathers. Um, a father's example of faithfulness is beautiful, needed, uniquely glorious in how it points to the Lord. My hope this morning is that, fathers, we would desire to grow in faithfulness, like as, as a father, that it'd be, it'd be a goal. Like we have, we have so many goals as a father, like in terms of what kind of father we'd like to be. I'd like us to strive for faithfulness. Here's a fun exercise uh, for you guys to do later, whether at the dinner table or at lunch for Father's Day. Ask your children, if you're eating with them, to describe dad. Like, what words would they use to describe dad? 
And depending on the age of your child, I mean, it, it will be a wide ranging, uh, uh, you know, wide range of answers. Um, I wonder if they would say faithful. I wonder if we were to ask ourselves the question, what kind of father I'd like to be, whether we would answer, I want to be faithful. I want to be a faithful father. Abraham models this so clearly for us this morning that he submits to God. And his faithfulness to God points to a trustworthiness in God. So this morning, I'd like to encourage dads, strive after faithfulness. Like, like me, like I think about sometimes I want to strive to be a better like, like fixer like as a, as a dad. Like I'm, I don't have a lot of like hand skills and I would like to know how to fix things. I, I'd like to... Uh, provide, I'd like to grow as a, in being more patient. All, these things are not wrong. But I, I was challenged in reading in this passage, like, do I want to be faithful? Do I want to grow in faithfulness as a dad? And so I hope that all of us can be challenged by Abraham's faithfulness this morning. Um, and that's where we'll, we'll close. Um, let's pray.